slide, please. This is Barbara Minkowitz, and we're going to talk about deformities in the lower extremity. I'm the medical director of pediatric bone health and the chief of pediatric orthopedics for Atlantic Health. We're going to learn how to evaluate varus and valgus leg deformities in children. We're going to talk about how you will know um, at which ages normal variants are present and to know when to consider an orthopedic consult. So limb alignment must be considered in three dimensions. In the AP plane, you can see varus and valgus deformities. In the lateral plane, you can see hyperextension of the knee and procurvatum. Rotational deformities that Dr. Dean just discussed are not measured off the x-ray. This is a twist in the bone itself, and um, she's already talked about femoral antiversion, and internal tibia torsion. So bow legs, or genovarum, is easy to remember um, as being bowed legs because varus has an R in the middle of the word. This is a closed letter, just as bowed legs are basically a closed deformity where you have a uh, space between the knees. In valgus, the L in the center is open like knock knees, which um, have a gap between the ankles. Causes of deformity can be physiologic, which typically resolve by the time the children are age eight. Pathologic etiologies include idiopathic, which can be familial or congenital, and can include Blount's disease. And in this picture up here, you can see a physiologic bowing, where you have bowing of both the femur and the tibias equally. Here you have some Blount's disease, which we'll discuss later, which is asymmetric and shows abnormalities at the proximal tibia. There's a congenital deformity. You can see a pathologic deformity from a tumor. Secondary reasons for deformities include infection, trauma, tumor, metabolic disease. So here we have a tumor. And some of these others, infection, traumas, can um, affect and destroy the growth plate in some way that will cause you to have an angular deformity. Excessive deformity leads to poor knee and ankle mechanics and joint instability. Patients will complain of knee, ankle, or leg pain. They get injuries to the joint surface of the knees and the ankles. They also have complaints about patella subluxation or dislocation, especially with valgus. 
Patients with valgus also can have a lot of recurrent ankle sprains. Patients will have pain with exercise. They can't play sports with their peers. They can't run. They are fatigued. They have a poorer quality of life. There's a huge mental health burden. Children make fun of them because of the way that they're shaped. And there are long-term implications for skeletal health and arthritis. Age is important for evaluation of limb alignment. Normal variants are found at different ages, and we expect resolution of most deformities in the young. Abnormal findings include excessive deformities that does not correct usually by age eight. And patients are the most bowed they're gonna be when they are first born. So from zero to 18 months, that's the bowed stage. Once patients get to 18 months, up to that age three, they're in the knock knee phase. And by the time they're age eight, they, all these deformities should be resolved or mostly resolved so that they're not an issue. Red flags include progressive worsening of the deformity, unilateral findings, and sharp curves. Clinical assessment needs to take into account of what the normal range for these deformities are. And in genuvarum, or bowed legs, we can accept up to about 15 centimeters of space between the knees. In genovalgum, we accept about nine centimeters between the ankles. And you have to understand that there are altered joint mechanics here. That's the whole problem. So here's a picture of a knock knee patient showing that because of this knock knee position, there is increased pressure across the lateral compartment of the knee. And the opposite would be true for bow legs. They would have medial knee uh, compartment pressure. And you can see the example of the normal knee um, shows equal pressure going through both medial and lateral compartments. A comprehensive physical exam is important in these patients. You want to include family history and the natural history in the family. And I just had a patient come in who's very not neat. And the mom says, yes, well, I have that too. And so does grandma, it hits all the girls in the family. And I said, well, we can fix this as your daughter grows. Would you like to do that? And she said, well, that would be great because I can hardly walk and grandma's already had a knee replacement. So if you talk to the family and you point things out and discuss what the options are, um, you can make patients very excited about changing what others have experienced. Patella tracking can be a very big issue, especially with knock knees. Gait pattern. You watch the way the patients are walking. Are they out -toed? Are they limping? Um, are they having chronic sprains in their ankles so that their ankles hurt? And some of these patients can barely walk down the hall. Um, and you, of course, want to know if there is any pain present. Imaging for these patients includes performing a scanogram, which is a long film to include hips, knees, and ankles. And we make measurements off of these x-rays to see where the deformity is coming from. Is it from the knee? If it's from the knee, is it from the femur? Is it from the tibia? Or is it from the ankle? And something for you to really pay attention to is that when patients come to your office and they're standing up, if they keep their legs externally rotated and they're not knee, you're not going to see the knock knee. They're going to hide it. If they look bow-legged because they're um, standing with their knees externally rotated, they may not actually have um, genuvarum. It may simply be compensation for tibia torsion. Surgical treatment options for these deformities include ablation of the physis. So if your patient is skeletally immature, you can close part of the physis or the whole physis and um, get correction in that way. You can perform an osteotomy where you actually cut the bone and realign the joint. This is immediate correction. It's more invasive and there are more complications. It's a longer healing time and it is the only choice if the patient is skeletally mature. So I really like to see these patients when they're growing. And here's an example of somebody that had an osteotomy and hardware placement. Guided growth or hemiopipsiodesis is from the Greek word physis for growth plate and desis to tether. So you're directing the growth of the leg. And I like to think of this as a bonsai tree procedure. You force 
the legs to grow the way that you want them to grow. You use implanted metal plates to tether the knee and inhibit growth on the overgrown side. And these are typically removed after about a year or so. So if in your knock knee patients, you're going to tether the inside of the leg and let the outside grow so that it will catch up and the legs will straighten out. And the opposite in someone that's bow-legged. This is less, inv less invasive, there are less complications, less recovery time than an osteotomy. And this is indicated when the patient is skeletally immature and it is the treatment of choice. Now, when we look at these patients not too closely, it's kind of like Pandora's box. They all look pretty similar. But then once you start really looking closely, you can tell the difference between the patients. So is this physiologic or non-physiologic? We have a two-year-old obese boy with bowed legs when walking. The bowing was present at birth. It's not getting worse. Now, when we look closely at this child, and you, you can see, it looks bowed standing, his legs, his tibias do not look bowed, but he does have severe internal tibia torsion. So when he's walking, he's actually turning his legs out so his feet point straight ahead. You're looking partly at the back of his legs, and this is what I would call pseudo-bowed, or walking like a cowboy. And the question is, do we worry about him? And we can give a minute for people to answer. And I don't know how that works. But um, I guess we'll go ahead and the answer is no, we don't worry about him. This is a patient with internal tibia torsion. He's two years old. He could be 90 degrees um, internally um, twisted as specified here. And we would expect resolution of this by the time he's eight. So now we have a two-year-old boy with both legs when walking. His bowing was present from birth, but is progressively worse. So on physical exam, you look closely. Yeah, he's got severe tibia torsion like the other kids, but his tibias actually look bowed as well. He has a family history of someone that needed surgery on their legs, and we've done an x-ray in this area. Are we going to worry about this one? And the answer is yes. We are going to worry about him. So here's a picture of the child who's got tibia torsion and Blount's disease. And the x-ray shows medial beaking when the knees are pointing straight ahead. And um, any child that's over 18 months where we see progressive bowing needs an x-ray. Bowing at birth that's physiologic includes both the femur and the tibia as being bowed. But in this case, it is just the tibia, and we have beaking medially. It's more common in males, bilateral in 50%, more common in African Americans and Hispanics. Treatment for infantile Blount's disease when it's in the early stages, and this is just a, a staging classification, uh, can be treated with knee, ankle, foot orthoses, but it has to be very mild cases and you have to brace them continuously for a while. And you may see improvement after one year with that. Um, worse outcomes are seen when the patient's bilateral or obese because you really can't put braces on somebody that's obese. And bilateral is very difficult. Um, and just to point out that sometimes with these very mild cases, even if you don't brace them, they will resolve. But if you do have progression, then surgery is indicated and you wanna get in there probably by, you know, when they're in their threes, before they're four or five. And options are going to include a proximal tibia osteotomy, guided growth, bifield bar resection, um, and hemi plateau elevation, which we'll look at again in a little bit. Now, here we have another two-year-old boy with bowed legs. Bowing's present at birth. He's progressively worse. He's fretful. He's got weight loss. He's under 3% height. Physical exam shows severely bowed legs. He's also got thick wrist joints, and he's almost exclusively breastfed. Do we worry about him? And the answer is yes. So someone that's breastfed, you need to be concerned, is not getting enough vitamin D. 
And so we have a vitamin D deficiency and this would be considered rickets. It appears earlier and milder than those patients who have vitamin D dependent rickets, which is basically a genetic rickets that um, patients get when they, they can't form the metabol metabolites of vitamin D well, or they have tissue insensitivity. And the joints are enlarged in these rachitic patients. You've got cuffed and flared metaphyses, as you can see in these pictures of x-rays. And the result is decreased calcium absorption, secondary hyperparathyroidism. The patient is spilling phosphates and calcium from the kidney, and they need to be treated with dietary supplements, including vitamin D, of course. So just to plug basic bone health here, um, you want your patients to be getting vitamin D3 based on the size of the patient or their labs if they're particularly low. Even in babies, they really don't get enough in formula and they should be given uh, vitamin D3 drops and certainly more as the patients are larger in size. Um, all patients over the age of three require 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day minimum. Um, under three, 700 milligrams. And you can get this, I always tell the patients, if they can get three calcium drinks a day, one orange juice with calcium, two milk, they're done. And then we need some vitamin C, which again, if they're getting some orange juice, they've checked that box. And we need a multivitamin. Just to throw in metabolic um, X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets, this, this is a seven-year-old with progressive bowing who had surgery for his bowing. And he had osteotomies, his legs were straightened out, but this is a kind of problem where the bone continues to be soft and he continued to bow even after he was fixed. And he's treated with phosphates. And this is a gene mutation which involves the PHEX gene. So now let's go to this four-year-old boy with knock knees. He's complaining of fatigue, pain walking, points to his knees, legs, ankles, feet. He trips when running, he's better with rest. Physical exam shows he's got bilateral genovalgum, flat feet, no pain in the office. Do we worry about this four-year-old? And the answer is going to be no. Um, this is a patient who's having pain due to physiologic knock knee, which starts at about 18 to 24 months of age. They do complain of fatigue and pain. But there's not much you're going to do about it. You're going to wait this one out. This patient's got seven centimeters between his ankles, which is not a big deal. Even if he has more than seven centimeters, we would accept it. And we would expect resolution by the age of eight. When the patient is standing or laying down and you put the ankles together to try to look for a limb length difference, you can actually make one leg look longer than the other. So you really want to look at these children standing or laying with the knees together. Don't push the ankles together. You're going to make them look like they've got a limb length discrepancy. And you can also see in this last x-ray here how the patient can hide their knock knee just by externally rotating their leg. So unless you're specifically looking for it, you may not see it. So here's a 12-year-old boy with progressive bowing of the knees. He's got fatigue, pain walking, points to his knees. He can't run or play for. He's got bilateral genovarum with 20 centimeters between the knees. He's also got internal tibia torsion. Do we worry about him? 12 years old. And the answer is yes. So um, this is what we call adolescent blounce disease. And he's got progressive bowing. He has more than 15 centimeters between his knees when his ankles touch. And you get an x-ray. And the x-ray shows medial beaking and deformity at the proximal tibia. Um, this is less common than infantile Blount's disease, more likely to be unilateral. And you can treat them with guided growth if they're skeletally immature. Um, in this case, this patient had an osteotomy. He doesn't, um, well, he does have some growth plates. Maybe he could have tried guided growth, but this was the chosen treatment. And um, they may need a hemi-plateau elevation. And you can see how depressed the tibia plateau is here. And sometimes we have to actually push that up to get that to correct. So now, 
Let's look at this 12 year old girl. She's got a dislocating patella. She wants her patella fixed. She came to the office because the patella is dislocating. It's going in and out all the time. She can't run her place for it. She's got bilateral genovalgum, 25 centimeters between her ankles. No one ever noticed she was not kneed before. It was like a shocker to point this out to the family. Do we worry about her? Are we going to fix her kneecap? How are we going to approach this child? So the answer is yes, this girl has a problem. Her x-ray shows um, that the patient is skeletally immature. She's got these knock knees, which are coming for both her knees and her ankles. And by putting guided growth plates at the knees and screws at the ankles to close the growth plate immediately, the patient was allowed to grow laterally at both the knee and the ankle, and she was able to straighten out her legs and her patella stabilized. And here's just a picture showing how when you put this tension band on, you can see how the bone grows out and straightens out. And she was very happy once this was done. So now we'll look at our last patient here, who I call Missed Opportunity. She's 11 years old. So you think 11-year-old girl, probably still growing, right? Well, wrong. She complains of bilateral knee pain for two years, which is better with rest. She can't participate in sports. She's got 18 centimeters between her ankles that, again, no one noticed before. She is skeletally mature on x-ray, so she can't have guided growth. Treatment for her will be to optimize her with therapy, which won't fix her mechanics. And if this fails, then surgery for her will really include a femoral osteotomy in order to correct her deformity. And once again, you can see why nobody noticed. If she externally rotates her legs, you won't notice that she's got um, genovalgum. Anyway, these are the XOXOs of pediatric orthopedics. Thanks for joining us.